Hi, Jim here, and you're listening to the Honest Filmmaker Podcast, career advice from people in the business. This week, I spoke to Phil Griffith, the educational lead at FrameSync. FrameSync is a virtual production company who helps storytellers by offering a full service consultancy, from creative planning to on-site delivery. They have a development arm creating tools for the industry and a series of courses helping to upskill creative practitioners in all things virtual production. This is a great one if you're interested in virtual production. It's something you don't know a lot about. I really grill Phil on all of the ins and outs of it. Uh, We also talked about whether this technology could be used by micro-budget, low-budget filmmakers, the impact it's having on the industry. Um, I asked him for the challenges of using this technology and the opportunities it presents. And we also talked about his own personal career. Uh, He was previously a music teacher, and now he's working in this brand new industry. Enjoy. So first of all, For those who don't know, tell me what virtual production is. Virtual production is really a kind of umbrella term for lots of different technologies and lots of different techniques. So the way I like to think about it is it kind of breaks down into like a couple of different areas. So you might want to think about visualization to begin with. That might be like pre-vis, post-vis, tech-vis. You might want to think about motion capture or performance capture. Um, You might want to think about like a hybrid approach which where you might have a green screen and tracked cameras. And then finally, what lots of people think of when they talk about virtual production is this kind of big LED wall and like Mandalorian style um, approach, which is is really what you call in-camera visual effects or ICVFX. That's how I like to sort of describe virtual production to people. Um, It's not just one thing. It's lots of different techniques, lots of different technologies. Right, okay. But you, you, I guarantee the thumbnail for this is going to have a big picture of an led screen on it because like you say that yeah is yeah immediately think of, <laughs> and it is kind of i guess am i right in saying that is the sort of latest bit of kit within these things you're talking about that's the, the most newest part of it yeah I, I think it's the part that um where lots of technologies have suddenly in the last five to ten years have got good enough to be able to um to make a real difference to film. So the quality of LED has increased. The quality of 3D tracking has increased. The quality of uh, render engines and computer power has increased. And therefore you can do things that you couldn't do 10 to 15 years ago. But really all of these um, sort of areas of virtual production have been around for a while. And then it's this culmination in the last few years. And then um, a couple of sort of big players in the industry putting some money into it and it being seen on screen in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, So yeah, that's why lots of people are now talking about it. Yeah. And do you think it's, is it changing filmmaking or is it just a tool in a box that people use or is it sort of changing everything? Yeah, I really try to think of it as a tool. It's a storytelling tool. And if it helps you um with your production because you want to shoot in a specific location that you can't get to and you you either can't fly your crew there or you just can't access it and instead you can shoot that on a volume fantastic if it helps you because you want to do a car scene and you don't want to have to block off roads and and sort of deal with all the health and safety and and those side of things and you want lovely reflections on your vehicles whether that's a car or a train or a plane perfect it's wonderful I, i think sometimes people are going down the route of I'm going to design a story around in-camera visual effects around this LED wall. Um, But really, I think storytelling should come first Mm -hmm. and you should have a great story and then work out what technology do you need to support the telling of that story? Yeah, Um, yeah, that's that's the way I like to think about it. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Out of interest, has a film been entirely shot on one of those yet? Yeah, I, I, I can't think of one that, I could sort of stand here and say, oh, it's entirely, mm. entirely on, on an LED volume. Um, there are shows such as 1899, where a significant part of the um, the, the story and the, and the filmmaking is based around uh, sets within that LED volume. Mm. But that doesn't mean that everything has been shot there. So, yeah, um, yeah. Not, not yet, as far as I'm aware. Happy yeah. to be correct. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Maybe someone will yeah. accept it. Um, so obviously I've got my micro budget, low budget hat on. Is this accessible to people with less money to make their film or not? This kind of technology? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's becoming more accessible. I think you have to think carefully about what you're trying to achieve. And again, I think the big barrier is that people see a huge LED volume. 
and and there's obviously an associated cost with that huge led volume but the reality of us working in the industry is that you don't always have to have a huge led volume to get what you want what you know there are shoots where um, particular sort of low budget shoots where you're trying to get two tvs to do the same um overall effect as that huge led volume might do and sometimes that can be really successful uh, you know I, I think in terms of low budget i did a one of the very first sort of virtual production shoots i did um i took unreal engine and i'd made uh, an environment in unreal engine along with one of my colleagues um and we then had a, a green screen background, but we tracked the camera position and then we composited sort of this 3D environment onto our footage uh, in post-production. Now, really that's still virtual production because we're still tracking a camera using a real-time environment. Um, we've got uh, sort of real um, physical sets and, and, and actors and everything in that. And then we've composited it in post-production. So that workflow cost less than a thousand pounds and we mm. got a really great music video out of it um but i think it just depends where your expectations are if you've got a if you want to film um you know a car commercial and you need an led volume that wraps all the way around your car there is an associated cost with that if you're really clever with how you line up shots maybe you use um uh, you know, maybe you use a smaller uh, amount of LED, maybe you use a TV, maybe you do some uh, rear projection or some front projection and and all of those other technologies that um, still fall underneath that virtual production bracket and are still, I, I think, really accessible. I think especially um, low budget filmmaking, thinking about projectors and and how you can sensibly use a projector is probably a great place to start. Yeah. But I don't want a projector. I want that big LED screen. That's what I want. <laughs> I mean, is that's it... <laughs> fine. In which case, you can you can have that big LED screen, and, and you can you can think carefully about how you want to use that, and then you yeah. can work out whether there's a budget for that. Sure. So so then, just thinking about it, because it's this new thing, so, and I know I'm focusing just on the LED screen, but it feels like it's the thing that people have most most questions about. Say I book this. I've got a bit of budget. I book it for a day what what am i paying for do i have to have special people there to work it can a regular dop turn up is he going to know instantly how to get his head around it are there data wranglers are there what, what are the sort of costs associated and personnel i need to make it work yeah sure so um studios often are providing all of the crew in order to make that system work and I think what's really important is to understand that people like your DOP are still an integral, absolutely important part of this overall process. And what you're getting when you go to that volume is, is probably the volume itself, the technology to run the volume, and hopefully some people to run that volume as well, unless you say you don't need them. But, but most of the time, they're coming as part of this package. And the thing that's most important, and I and sort of I try and do and we at FrameSync try and encourage people to do is to think about pre-production and the planning in the pre-production stage and working with whoever's on your volume to make sure that the content that you put onto that wall looks as good as it can do. Do you, for example, need a 3D environment? Or could you get away with um, two-dimensional plate footage? Maybe you're just trying to do a car scene and therefore you don't actually need to build a 3D environment in Unreal Engine or Unity or, or various other programs. You actually just need some two-dimensional footage playing back to give the effect of, um, uh, of the car moving. Mm. And depending on which shoe you're going to, you might find that it's actually cheaper to run two-dimensional footage than it is to build a fully 3D environment. So it's trying to work with the sort of virtual production team to figure out what's the best way forward for your particular story. Um, yeah, that's that's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, and just thinking about that, because I, I sort of watched, when I knew I was going to chat to you, I watched a few clips as you do, and I watched some stuff from the Batman, and like you say, there were some shots of him on a motorbike where the background was just blurred stuff because he's on his yep. motorbike, which looked really yep. cool. Um, so you kind of, I guess you can get away with some stuff. But looking at the uh, Unreal Engine, everyone talks about it. So so we know, do you have to pay for Unreal Engine? Where do you learn to use it? Can I watch a bunch of YouTubes and figure it out? Or do I need to go on a course? 
Yeah, sure. No, great question. So um, at the moment, Unreal Engine is uh, still free to download. My understanding is that there, there is going to be a, a licensing for which I don't have personally all of the details as I don't work for Epic Games, but they are visible online. I think it's to do with whether you're, uh, as a studio, you're hitting about a million pounds for your project. But please check that out. Don't, uh, don't hold me to that. Um, but the one thing I would say is that you can go onto the Epic Games website um, download the Epic Games launcher, and then you can install Unreal Engine from there. At the moment, um, as of, where are we, April 2024, we're on, most of us are working in version 5.3, 5.4 preview has just come out. Um, yes, there are loads of tutorials on YouTube. Um, there are various courses from lots of different providers. Uh, you can go and figure it out. Um, and and I, I've personally just really enjoyed exploring that as an avenue for creativity. Um, and yeah, now I get to use it in my day job as well. So, um, yeah. yeah. And is there anything you would liken it to? Is, is there any other um, programs you, a filmmaker might use you'd liken it to? Um, I, so I guess if you've ever done any 3D, you might have used Blender before because that's also free. And so I, I think there's really good comparisons between Blender and Unreal Engine. And if you've done game design, you might have done that in Unity or Unreal Engine. So there's a comparison there. I think there are comparisons. So when you start getting into the um, sort of uh, camera positioning and lining up camera shots that's still timeline based in a part of Unreal Engine called Sequencer so that would that's similar to working in DaVinci Resolve or Final Cut um, and it, so I, I think Unreal pulls lots of different threads from different programs I guess um, uh, but it's uh, yeah it I think it's okay for getting started. I think yeah. it's a good place to get started. You don't need to learn how to code um, if you don't want to, although that is an option if you choose to go down that route. Um, and I think even just getting some pre-visualization pre um, practice in, mm -hmm. um, blocking out different scenes, that is a, that's a great place to start. And am I right in saying you do have to pay for assets so if you're paying for or is that all free as well so if i want a certain type of tree have i got to pay for that or how's that work so the way i would look at it is you can pay for assets mm -hmm. but you don't have to there is a huge um epic games marketplace in which people have uploaded things that you can purchase um one thing just to say about that is every month there's a free selection of of um assets that epic games give out but the the real uh, I would say one of the best parts of Unreal Engine is the uh, Quixel bridge and the, the Quixel assets, uh, the Megascans asset library, because there's 15,000 or something different assets that you can get for free. Um, you can download them in, in a variety of different resolutions and just bring them straight into your game. And mm. that's, I would say I've done that 98% of the time for building uh building levels I, I think i've probably bought two asset packs maybe three in total you you don't have to pay money to get started here i would say just get get started download it and have a go have a go okay so then that brings me on to the next thing i would worry about as a filmmaker uh copyright legal stuff so if i'm i guess i would do i would get a somebody in who's an expert on unreal engine they'd create my backgrounds i'd have the same sort of contract i'd have with any special effects person i'm assuming because that's their work on screen um so with those assets do i need to worry about that do you think is that something i've got to keep track of what assets they're using are the people who created those assets going to come after me if i've used them in a feature film and am i allowed to use sure. them in a feature film yeah, so I, my understanding with the Megascans assets, and please do read the T's and C's before <laughs> yeah. uh, taking this to uh, taking this to print, everyone. But um, uh, my understanding is it fits under the Epic Games license around whether you're paying after you've got a successful uh, product. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I've never needed to really explore that avenue. I, um, I would say that lots of the time when you're working, you're likely to work with what's called a VAD, which is a virtual art department just in the same way that you might you would work with a normal vfx house mm -hmm. and you would have the, an agreement with them that says the assets that they're making are, are for use on your film and, and possibly only on your film depending on what agreement you make so i think that's that's not something to worry about that's just a question to ask and a, and a t's and c's to check if you're um you know yes that, that's yeah. what i would suggest t's and c's um and then looking what's what's the future what's in store like further down the line for this, do you think? Where's it going? Yeah, I, I think um, 
we're always working towards photorealism. How real can you make that LED wall look? There's a, an awful lot of research and exploration into the color pipeline at the moment and how does an LED wall um, reproduce color? And how accurate is that in comparison to sunlight at different times of the day? Um, we've got sort of in the process of being launched at the moment are a number of new uh, LED processors and LED panels, which should um, effectively more accurately reproduce light. And I think that will be really interesting for DOPs um, and, and anyone who's, and, and colorists and uh, DITs and, and anyone who's got a particular focus on the color accuracy of an LED wall and how to manipulate that color to get the, the best out of the LED wall. I, I think that's particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. I think there's some, um, there'll be some interesting steps around generative AI and how that can produce either environments or to what would be called two and a half D um, which is kind of where you have a series of, of static images that are stacked in a three-dimensional world. And that that will be interesting. I, I think um, a, another possible offshoot is the uh, development of machine learning techniques for uh, rotoscoping. And maybe that will get to the stage where you're using an LED wall, but you're really using it to capture light and light from the scene. And then possibly you rotoscope your actor anyway. Um, that's That happens at the moment. There's, um, yeah, there, there's a whole host of really interesting things sort of happening, um, especially, you know, even if you just take uh, graphics cards and, and how great a now consumer graphics card is, in order to produce these environments you're saying earlier about sort of low budget and, and entering this world if you're particularly interested in um sort of computer gen generated uh imagery and, and animation that you can now get a graphics card for cheaper than oh sorry the, the graphics card you can get to can do more than it's ever done before mm. and and just rendering a, a cg video from from something like unreal can be quite an incredible storytelling device so yeah yeah lots of areas lots, lots of, things of areas to... exciting times but then uh flip side what are the sort of challenges and the downsides yeah i, I think the downsides are that we're or maybe the challenge is that we're combining lots of technology and we're pushing that every single day to tell creative stories. Mm. I must say, though, I don't think that's any different from any other time in history. You know, if you track back over um, the history of ILM, for example, and, and there's a fantastic documentary about that history, every time they make a movie, they're trying to push things forward. And that's really the same as what we're trying to do in virtual production. We're... I mean, you know, if you look at the behind the scenes for The Flash and Aquaman in the way that they had um, an Insta360 camera recording above one actor. And so that's capturing all of the, uh, it's capturing footage on either side of the camera. And then they're replaying that footage to get light emission onto uh, an actor's face. So they're accurately, they can accurately map that face effectively. That's an incredible technology, but it's, at the forefront mm -hmm. and because no one had done that as far as i'm aware no one had tried that technique before the flash and and it was um you know it's challenging mm -hmm. whenever you're trying to do something that you're having to um alter software in order to do the thing that you want it to do it's it's going to be hard and i think that the best thing that people can do is to try and up and upskill themselves in a sort of broad sense what's happening in this wide world of virtual production and you don't have to go super deep into all of these areas but find someone who is a specialist in that particular area and and be able and go and talk to them mm -hmm. but by having a broad level of knowledge you can at least have um an articulate conversation <laughs> yeah. around what you need as a storyteller um yeah I, I think there will always be challenges in that sense yeah and i would i would say that's a good piece of advice for anyone producing or directing is to have a broad range of knowledge of all of the roles on set but this specifically if you're using this if you can if you can have that conversation it's going to make your life so much easier if you're going to use it um yeah one other thing uh i've seen one I've looked at it. I haven't touched it. Does it get hot? Do I, is what are the, is there any safety issues around it? Is it yeah, assuming sure. it uses a lot of juice? 
yeah okay yeah so i mean it will get it will get warm um and i, I guess in terms of safety issues just things to be aware of is is how it's being hung are you ground stacking it from the floor up or are you hanging it from a truss um but but there are some there are a huge number of very competent people at building led yeah. um and and it's yeah there are some great teams out there who can help you and i guess the other thing just to jump back to your previous point around how much does it cost and and where do you go and what do you mm -hmm. need is 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 remembering that you you don't have to go to a studio that has one of these led volumes pre-built if you have a specific scenario and you can reach out to people who provide that led and they they can build that in the dimensions that you need it mm -hmm. and therefore if you've got a specific use case and you don't want 25 meters by five meters from a particular studio you can adapt and 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 led uh, providers distributors uh, suppliers sorry will be able to help you with that with that journey so um yeah, yeah i don't think there's i mean health and safety you don't want to kick it um you, you know there's don't kick it. Yes. got it right no, yeah we got I, uh, kick it. yeah I, I was i was somewhere the other day and i um someone had clearly walked along and and hit the led with something rather sharp Ooh. so i ended up and so they, they basically took some pixels off of a one of the yeah. panels and ended up swapping it out and yeah the, the the accident i would say accidents happen but equally you're you're dealing with a um you know an expensive piece of equipment but i would say every every one on film sets i've ever been on they're well versed in not touching other people's equipment mm -hmm. and and just making sure you're respectful of who's around you and, and what they're doing so um yeah so the other thing i was going to say was presumably companies that have got these leds uh volume set up aren't being used all the time so maybe there's some space there for a micro low budget filmmaker to say hey it's not being used this weekend can we come in and get a bit of money off uh, yeah i would absolutely agree with that as an opportunity mm. and i would certainly say that if you have an led volume in your area either by with a professional studio a university a test site you know any of these things and you're interested just get in contact and say look i'm really interested in, in how we can use this is there a way we can work together and and as a as a storyteller be inventive you know is it that they can let you use the volume but they get publicity from um from when you publicize the film how, can, how, how benefit in kind is there anything that you can do to help them at the same time if they're trying to build the studio is there a reduced rate they could give it to you for you know how does that all that work I, I think the the one thing I'm finding at the moment is, is studios don't uh, they don't always have set rates specifically you know it depends how long do you want the studio for how many are you shooting 2d 3d uh, is it a particularly quiet period is it a busy you know all of these things all of these variables um can be can be quite flexible mm. and and i would say it's much better to go and start that conversation and, and maybe you find that, that that there is no space at the moment and it just mm. doesn't work out and that happens but i would say you know just back to that green screen story um of my first virtual production shoot we um I, I had multiple teams sort of working together and the studio very very kindly gave us the studio for free because they wanted to see how the technology was used and what could be done with it and whether it was something that they wanted to use in the future mm -hmm. so it kind of became a, a win-win because my team were trying to test the technology and test it creatively they wanted to do the same thing the band wanted something that didn't cost very much money could we find a way of working oh there's a gap in the diary let's go for two days great you know I, I think this whole industry is about relationships and about people and I think as long as you're as long as you're aware of what you're asking mm. and I, I say what the cost of that is i don't necessarily mean financially but um in, in any sense what the cost of that ask is and, and is it the right time to ask is it day one you've turned up there you've looked at the led wall and you've gone can i have this on saturday <laughs> yes from, you know maybe not the best way forward this is a valuable asset for that studio and it takes a high level of skill to use it to its the best of its ability mm. um are you in the right place of, as a filmmaker to take advantage of that 
you know, I, I spoke to a director not too long ago and, and they came to see me and said, I, I've got uh, it's sort of on the um, the thread of what you were saying about has anyone shot everything in a volume? And they said, I want to shoot this short film. I'm going to shoot everything in a volume. And I said, well, actually, there's a couple of things here that you'd probably just be better to find a location for mm. in, in terms of the budget that you're working at. Um, and there's you don't have to do everything on a LED stage if you if you don't want to, <laughs> if, yeah. if there's not a need for it. You know, yeah. Think carefully about that use case. Yeah. Good advice. Um, and I'm sure you get asked this a lot. How, well, not the specific version of this question, but how long is it going to be before I can go to Costco and buy one and bring it home and do it home myself? What, and buy an LED screen? Yeah. How, how before uh, it's like, I'm looking at the sort of 599 uh, price range. I'll buy 599. One, yeah, right. only as big as this room. How, how long have I got to wait? How many years do you think? Uh, so, uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows? But I would say, at your current budget level yeah i would just go and buy a very very big non-reflective tv right and, uh, and 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 that would probably get you further than further than you would think i'm not actually. even sure i'd get a very good telly for that money at the moment I'd probably yeah get maybe, a... maybe not how am i going to get you an led wall for that then <laughs> it's a trick it's a question it's, it's a trick, trick question, question. Yeah, there's trick no question. way <laughs> um so then the other thing I was interested to ask you about was because when I met you, um, you talked about having a, a different career before you got into this game. Yeah, and it was, yeah. I guess, my interest was, wow, because this is a new technology, are there new careers opening up into it? So it was really just a bit about your own journey into this. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, so I was a teacher for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um I was a uh, taught music and music tech and then was head of uh, music technology, uh, sorry, head of music at a few different schools and worked my way up into working in a sixth form and and then decided that I, I just really wanted to change. I really wanted to move into um, really film, TV, video, media production, somewhere around that. So I worked for a video production company for about 18 months and then about... Yeah, about 18 months ago from now, I just decided that I really wanted to push into the film, TV and live events using all of this um, sort of virtual production technology, for want of a better phrase. And yeah, did a lot of learning. <laughs> <laughs> did a, uh, took, took as many sort of courses as I could. I do a lot of reading, um, did a lot of experimenting with, um, you know, with all, all as, as much of the technology as I could get access to, whether mm. that's disguise or pixera or unreal engine or blender or um just really to try and grasp um grasp that broad brush stroke and i think the the benefit for someone like me coming into the industry at this point is that i bring i bring other skills so i bring people skills and management skills and production skills and now I have a technical aspect within this world of virtual production as well. And that combination is, is, um, is, has, has really helped me mm -hmm. um, because it means I can, I can talk to lots of different stakeholders and pull their creative ideas into a virtual production space. But I can also work with bringing my team together to make sure we get that delivered. Mm -hmm. And and that has helped me a great deal. I think in terms of are there new roles? Yeah, I, I think there are new roles um, in terms of how the sort of game engine approach of something like Unreal Engine has combined with the film and TV approach of, of, of being on set. So things like being an Unreal Engine operator on set wasn't really a thing 10 years ago. As far as I'm aware, you know, I can't track back for the first time Unreal hit a scene, but I'll hit a set. That's a new position. Something like a virtual production supervisor, as it is, it's kind of being called at the moment, is is really again a newish position. Mm. Um, I think that there's a um, maybe a slight misunderstanding about the skill level required to do some of those things. Mm. Um, it's not it, it's not as simple as um day one in film and tv day two virtual production supervisor mm. um, there's, there's a lot of learning that takes place and and there's a real balance between the complexity of the technology and the system and making it all work and ease of use 
Mm. And at FrameSync, we, we're doing a lot to try and make that ease of use um, a focus, both for universities and for um, DOPs and directors on set and, and trying to enable filmmakers to do what they do best. But there is still an awful lot of technology that goes on under the hood. Mm. And that's why having having specialists there to um, to to bring the best out of you as a filmmaker is is a really good idea. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me and how <laughs> I've kind of got into this. And um, yeah, is there a is there a website or an online resource you would suggest people use to kind of keep up to date with this stuff? What do you subscribe to anything in particular? I think if you're trying to figure out words, there's something called VP Glossary, um, which is a great uh, it's a glossary of words within virtual production. Um, there's a group called Starting Pixel, which is a group of professionals who are um, all really working in virtual production. There's a framework, which isn't specifically about virtual production, but is about wider immersive technologies. Um, there's it's it's always helpful to to sort of keep in touch with with people like Disguise or Pixera, um, Epic Games, um, companies like FrameSync or Lux Machina and, and, and people who are working in this space um, just to sort of see what's going on. There's, there's so much happening. If you were to then list companies like, um, like Roe or Brompton who do make LEDs and LED processors mm. and there's, there's lots changing and I think it can be quite overwhelming to begin with. Um, and so it's worth thinking about once you've got a broad brush stroke of understanding which elements go into virtual production, which bit are you most interested in? Are you most interested in the 3D um, creation, world creation? Are you most interested in the media server that might run it? Are you most interested in the tracking system, the camera tracking system? Um, you know, which which bit are you sort of most interested in? Or maybe you're interested in the production side of looking after a virtual production shoot. All of those aspects um, are, are worthy explorations, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, what, in your opinion, is the best use of virtual production in a TV show or film? Sure. Um, I, I watched behind the scenes for 1899 not too long ago. And uh, so series on Netflix and they had a huge curved LED with a ship inside it. And, and I won't ruin it for people that want to go and watch the series. But I just think. Uh, personally, I think they made a great choice in um, the production design and how they would blend the production with the LED wall. Uh, it just I didn't work on it or, or know any of the work that worked on it. But from what I've seen, they really well planned out how they were going to do that shoot, why they should use an LED wall and what they should put on that LED wall. And and that's that's just really great to see um, It's because then you you watch the series and you're just immersed in it. You're not thinking, oh, there's an LED wall there. You, it, it, it just looks like it should do if they were on a ship in the middle of the ocean. Um, yeah, I think that the, yeah. the overall culmination of what they managed to pull together was really great. Yeah. And if I'm, if it's the one I'm thinking of, which I also watched and thought was awesome, and it was the sort of art direction was beautiful as well, and it all kind of married up. The only spoiler is, is they've cancelled it, haven't they? <laughs> They're not making another <laughs> series, <laughs> which always happens with anything good. <laughs> um, <laughs> damn it. So um, if my next question is, if you could remake any film using virtual production, what would it be? Oh, I could remake any film i i think the thing i'd be tempted to sort of remake would be um kind of any movie in the 60s where there's a car and there's a rear projection and it's kind of not matched at all to what's happening in the scene but um i'm also sort of quite nostalgically fond of those things <laughs> and looking back at some of the James Bond movies and thinking ah oh, you know what it doesn't look realistic but Sean Connery's there and, and I'm in the story I'm in the moment and I still believe it and and that's what we're always really aiming for so um yeah there we go that's what I do that's what I do I hope you enjoyed this week's episode 
If you want more advice from industry professionals who are out there at the moment working, or you just want to listen to some cool stories from film sets from around the world, then please do subscribe. Thank you.